from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. OpenAI, the company, and ChatGPT have taken the world by storm. Microsoft reportedly is investing an additional $10 billion into the company, but in our view, while the hype around ChatGPT is justified, we don't believe OpenAI will lock up the market with its first mover advantage. Rather, we believe that success in this market will be directly proportional to the quality and quantity of data that a technology company has at its disposal and the compute power that it can deploy to run its system. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we unpack the excitement around chat GPT and debate the premise that the company's early entry into the space may not confer winner take all advantage to open AI. And to do so, we welcome CUBE collaborator, alum Sar Sar Sarbjeet Johal, and John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE. Great to see you, Sarbjeet. Yeah. John, really appreciate you guys coming to the program. Great to be on. Okay, so what is chat GPT? Well, actually, we asked chat GPT, what is chat GPT? So here's what it said. Chat GPT is a state-of-the-art language model developed by OpenAI that can generate human-like text it can be fine-tuned for a variety of language tasks, such as conversation, summarization, and language translation. So I asked it, give it to me in 50 words or less. How did it do? Anything you add? Yeah, I, I think it did good. It's large language model, uh, like previous models, but it started applying the transformers uh, sort of mechanism to focus on what prompt you have given it to itself. And then also the what answer it gave you in the first sort of one sentence or two sentences, and then introspect on itself, like what I have already said to you, and so just work on that. So it's it's self sort of a, um, focus, if you will. It, it does the transformers help the large language models to do that. So to your point, it's a large language model, and GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And if you put the definition back up there again, if you put it back up on the screen, let's see it back up. Okay, it actually missed um, the large, word large. So one of the problems with chat GPT, it's not always accurate. It's actually a large language model and it says a state of the art language model. And if you look at Google, Google has dominated AI for many times and they're well known as being the best at this. And apparently Google has their own large, large language model, LLM in play and have been holding it back to release because of backlash on the accuracy, like just in that example you showed, is a great point. They got almost right, but they missed the key word. You know what's funny about that, John, is, is I had previously asked it in my prompt to give me it in less than 100 words, and it was too long. I said I was too long for breaking analysis. And, and there it went into the fact that it's a large language model. So it largely, it gave me a really different answer the, for both times. So, but it's still pretty amazing for those of you who haven't played with it yet. And one of the best examples that I saw was Ben Charrington from uh, this, the, this Week in MLAI podcast. And I stumbled on this thanks to uh, uh, Brian Gracely, who was listening to one of his cloudcasts. Basically what Ben did is he took, he prompted ChatGPT to interview ChatGPT and he simply gave the system the prompts and then he ran the questions and answers into this avatar builder and sped it up 2X so it did, didn't sound like a machine and voila, it was amazing. So. John, is ChatGPT going to take over as a Cube host? Well, I was thinking we get the questions in advance sometimes from PR people. We should actually just plug it in ChatGPT, add it to our notes and say, is this good enough for you? Let's ask the real question. So I think, you know, I think there's a lot of heavy lifting that gets done. I think the ChatGPT is a phenomenal revolution. I think it highlights the use case, like that example we showed earlier. It gets most of it right, so it's directionally correct and it feels like it's an answer, um, but it's not 100% accurate. And I think that's where people are seeing value in it. Writing marketing copy, brainstorming a, a guest list, um, get, uh, uh, a gift list for somebody, write me some lyrics to a song, give me a thesis about healthcare policy in the United States. It'll do a bang up job. And then you got to go in and you can massage it. So it could do three quarters of the work. That's why uh, plagiarism and schools are kind of freaking out. And that's why Microsoft put 10 billion in because why wouldn't this be a feature of Word or, or the OS to help it do stuff on behalf of the user? So linguistically, it's a beautiful thing. You can input a string and get a good answer. It's not a search result. And we're going to get your take on, on Microsoft. And 
but it kind of levels the playing field. Chat GPT writes better than I do, Sarbjeet. I know you have some good examples too. You mentioned the Reed Hastings. Example. Yeah, I was listening to Reed Hastings' uh, fireside chat with Chat GPT, and the answers were coming as, as sort of voice in the voice format. And it was amazing what he was having very sort of f philosophy kind of talk with the chat GPT, like longer sentences, like he was going on, like the, just like we were talking. He was talking for like almost two minutes and then chat GPT was answering. It was like one sentence question and then a lot of uh, answer, answers from chat GPT. And, and yeah, you're right. I, I, this is what I believe. I've, I've been thinking deep about this since yesterday. We talked about like we want to do this segment. Um, the data is fed into the, the data model. It can be the current data as well. But I think that like models like ChatGPT, other, other companies will have those too. They can, they can, they are democratizing the, the intelligence, but they're not creating intelligence yet. Yet, definitely yet, I can say that. They, they, they will give you all the finite answers, like, okay, how do you do this for loop in Java versus you know, C Sharp, and as a programmer, you can do that. Um, in, but they can't tell you that how to write a new algorithm or, or write a new algorithm, search algorithm for, for you. They cannot create a secretive code for you to <laughs> Not have yet. competitive advantage. Not, Not yet, you're yet. Uh, but, but, but you Can Google do that today? No, no one really can. No, no. The reasoning side of the data is, we talked about this at our SuperCloud event with uh, Jamal Gandhi, who was uh, CEO of now of Next Data. This next wave of data intelligence is going to come from entrepreneurs that are probably cross-discipline, computer science and, and some other discipline, but they're going to be new things. For example, data, metadata and data, it's hard to do reasoning like a human being. So that needs more data to train itself. So I think the first gen of this training module for the large language model they have is a corpus of text. Yeah. A lot of that's why blog posts are, but the facts are wrong and sometimes out of context because that contextual reasoning takes time, it takes intelligence. So machines need to become intelligent and so therefore they need to be trained. So you're going to start to see, I think, a lot of acceleration on training, the data sets, and again, it's only as good as the data you can get. And again, proprietary data sets will be a huge winner. Anyone who's got a large corpus of content, proprietary content like theCUBE or SiliconANGLE as, as a publisher will benefit from this. Large FinTech companies, anyone with large proprietary data will probably be a big winner on this generative AI wave because it just it will eat that up and turn that back into something better. So I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things to look at here um, and certainly Productivity is going to be off the charts for vanilla, and the the internet is going to get swarmed with vanilla content. So if you're uh, in the content business and you're an original content producer of any kind, you're going to be not vanilla. So you're going to be better. So I think there's so much at play, Dave. To well, yeah, the, the, I think the playing field has been risen. Mm. So we risen and leveled. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and <laughs> leveled to a certain extent. <laughs> so so it's not like that. That few people as consumers, as, as consumers of uh, AI, we will have an advantage and others cannot have that advantage. So it will be democratized. That, I'm, I'm sure about that. But if you take the example of calculator, when the calculator came in, and a lot of people said, oh, people can't do math anymore because calculator is there, right? So it's a similar sort of moment, uh, just like a calculator uh, for the next level. But, but again- I see, I see it more like open source, Sarbji, because like, if you think about what ChatGPT is doing, you do a query and it comes from somewhere. The, the value of a post from ChatGPT is just a reuse of, of AI. The original content accent will become from a human. So if I, if I lay out a paragraph from ChatGPT, does some heavy lifting on some facts, I check the facts, save me about maybe yeah, a, it's a, an hour writing, and then I write a killer two, three sentences of like sharp original thinking or critical analysis. I then took that body of work, open source content, and then laid something on top but of it. But Sarbjee's example is a good one because like the calculator, kids don't do math as well anymore. The slide rule, remember we had slide rules as kids. Remember when you first started using Waze, you know, yeah, we were in the minority and you had an advantage over other drivers. Now Waze is like, you know, social traffic, you know, navigation. Everybody had, you know. All the back roads are uh, crowded. They're car crowded, <laughs> exactly. All right, let's, let's move on. What about this notion that futurist Ray Amara put forth and really uh, Amara's law that we're showing here, uh, it's, it, it, the, the law is we, you know, we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. Is that the case, do you think, with uh, chat GPT? What do you think, Sarbjeet? 
I think that's true. Actually, there's a there's a lot We're of debate this. There's there's a lot okay. of ah oh, like like when people see the results from ChatGPT, they say, "What? What the heck? Like it can do this?" But then if you use it more and more and more, and I ask the set of similar question, not the same question, and it, it gives you like same answer. It's like reading from the same bucket of text. Right? In in mm -hmm. in the interview Reed Hoffman did with the chat GPT, you will see that in, in some in one, couple of segments. It's very, it sounds so boring that the chat GPT is coming with the same two mm -hmm. sentences every time. So so it is it is kind of, good but it's not as good as people think it is right now but but we will we'll have go through this you know hype sort of cycle and get realistic with it and then in the long term i think it's a great thing in the short term it's it's not something which will what's your counterpoint jobs you're saying it's not i i know i think the question was it's hyped up in the short term and not it's underestimated long term that's yeah. what i think what he yeah. said yeah yeah Quote. that's what he said yeah okay i i'm i think that's wrong with this because um, this is a unique, ChatGPT is a unique kind of impact. And it's very generational. People have been comparing it, I have been comparing it to the internet, like the web, web browser, Mosaic, and Netscape Navigator. I mean, I clearly still remember the days seeing Navigator for the first time, oh, wow. And there were not many sites you could go to. Everyone typed in, you know, uh, cars.com, you know. That's not, wasn't that overestimated, the overhyped at the beginning? And well, underestimated? No, it was long quite, it was underestimated long run. Well, that, thought, but that's, thought, that's a Moore's law. That's what it is. No, no, they said overestimated. Par o overestimated near term, underestimated long, overhyped near term, underestimated long term. Like, uh, uh, right? Well, I mean, I, yeah, okay. So I would then agree. Okay, then we were off the charts about the internet in the early days, and it actually exceeded our expectations. Well, there were people who were like poo-pooing it early on. So when the when the browser came out, people were like, "Oh, the web's a toy for kids." I mean, well, in 1995, the web was a joke. Right, so yeah. 96, you had online populations growing. So you had structural changes going on around the browser, internet population, and then that replaced other things, direct mail, other business activities that were once analog, then went to the web, kind of read only as, you, as we always talk about. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a moment where the hype long-term, the, lo the smart money and the smart industry experts all get the long term, and in this in this case, there's more poo pooing in the short term. Ah, it's not a big deal. It's just it's just AI. I've heard I've heard many people poo pooing Chat GPT, and a lot of smart people saying, no, no, this is Dex Gen. This is different, and it's only going to get better. So I think people are estimating a big long game on this one. So you're saying it's bifurcated, as those yeah. say. Okay. All right. Let's get to the heart of the premise and possibly the debate for t today's episode. Will open AI's early entry into the market confer sustainable competitive advantage? for the company. And if you look at the history of tech, the technology industry, it's kind of littered with first mover failures. Altair, IBM, Tandy, Commodore, they, and Apple even, they were really early in the PC game. They took a back seat to Dell, who came on the scene years later with a better business model. Netscape, you're just talking about, was the, all the rage in Silicon Valley with the first browser, drove up all the housing prices out here. Alta Vista was the first search engine to really you know, index full text. And owned by Dell, I mean Dec. Owned by, owned by Digital, and yeah, then digital Compaq bought it. And yeah. you know, of course, as an aside, Digital, they wanted to showcase their hardware, right? Their, their supercomputer stuff. And then so, Friendster and MySpace, they came before Facebook, the iPhone certainly wasn't the first mobile device, so lots of failed examples, but there are some recent successes, like AWS and cloud. You could say smartphones, so I mean. Well, I know, and you could, we can parse this, so we'll debate it. The Twitter, you could argue, had first mover advantage. You kind of gave me that one, John. Bitcoin and crypto clearly had first mover advantage in sustain, sustaining that. Guys, will OpenAI make it to the list on the right with ChatGPT, what do you think? Uh, I think, Categorically, as a company, it probably won't. But as a category, I think what they're doing will. So OpenAI is a company that get funding. There's di power dynamics involved. Microsoft put a billion dollars in uh, early on. Then they just ponied up. Now they're reporting 10 billion more. So like if the browsers, Microsoft had competitive um, advantage over Netscape and used monopoly power and convicted by the D Department of Justice yeah. for killing Netscape with their monopoly, Netscape should have had won that battle. But Microsoft killed it. In this case, Microsoft's not killing it, they're buying into it. So mm. I think the embrace, extend Microsoft power here makes open AI vulnerable for that one vendor solution. So 
the AI as a company might not make the list, but the category of what this is, large language model uh, AI, is probably will be on the right-hand okay, side. Okay, we're going to come back to the, the, the government intervention and maybe do some comparisons, but what are your thoughts on this premise here that, that it will we basically set, put forth the premise that it, that ChatGPT, its early entry into the market, will not confer competitive advantage to or open AI. To open AI. Do you agree with that? I agree with that, actually, it, it, because Google has been at it and they have been holding back, as, as John said, because of the scrutiny from the Fed, right? So um, and privacy and, too, and, and the privacy and the accuracy as well. But I think Sam Altman and the company on those guys, right? Uh, they they put they have put this in a hasty way out there, you know, because it makes mistakes and there are a lot of uh, questions around the, the the sort of how, where the content is coming from. You saw that ex your example; it just stole the content without your permission. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, just as quick aside. It, it, it quotes it quotes uh, on people's behalf, and the, those quotes are wrong. So there's a lot of sort of false information it's putting out there. So it's a very vulnerable thing to do. What Sam Altman. Uh, so did. even though it'll get better, others will compete. So look, just just for side note, a, a term which Reid Hoffman used a little bit, like uh, he, he said, it's experimental launch. Like, yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's pretty damn good. It, 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 is, it is clever yeah. because it's, according to Sam. It's more than clever. Yeah. It's good. It's awesome if you haven't <laughs> used it yet. I mean, you, write, yeah. you, you read what it writes and you go, this thing writes so well. It writes so much better than but the human than emotion. The human emotion drives that too. I think that's a big thing. But, but I want to add no, one, one, last one more, please. last one. Yeah. Okay. So, but he he he's still holding back. He's conducting quite a few interviews. If if you want to get the gist of it, there's an interview with uh, um, Strictly VC. Uh, interview from yesterday with Sam Altman. Uh, listen to that one. It's it's sort of eye opening. What they want, where they want to take it. Mm -hmm. But but my my last one I want to make it on this point is that. Satya Nadella yesterday did an interview with Wall Street Journal. I think he, he was doing You were not impressed. I was not impressed because he was pushing it too much. So Sam Altman is holding back, so the, there's less backlash. 10 billion backlash. reasons to push. I think. I think he <laughs> just laid off 10,000 people. Hey, Chad GPT, find me a job. <laughs> you know, like. He's overselling over it to an extent that, that I think it will backfire on Microsoft and he's over promising a lot of stuff right now. I think, I don't know why he's very jittery about all these things. And he did the same thing during the Ignite as well. So he said, oh, this AI will write code for you and this and that. Like, the we, hyperbole we from Satya Nutella. Yeah. Yeah, 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 he's I, got a lot of hyperbole. Uh, uh, and he, also, he, all right, edgy. Let, let's, go ahead. Well, can I weigh in on the whole yeah, sure. Microsoft thing <laughs> uh, on whether open AI, here's, here's the take on this. I think it's more like the browser moment to me because I could relate to, that experience with Chachi uh, personally, emotionally, when I saw that. And I remember vividly- that time. aha moment to like, This is obviously yeah. the future. Anything else in the old old world is dead. Websites going to be everywhere. It was just instant dot connection for me and a lot of other smart people who saw this. A lot of people, by the way, didn't see it. Um, someone said the web's a toy. Not, at the company I was working for at the time, Hewlett Packard, they, like, they could have been in, they had invented HTML. And so like all this stuff was like, they just passed. The web was just being passed over. But at that time, the browser got better. More websites came on board. So the structural advantage there was online web usage was growing, online user population. So that was growing exponentially with the rise of the Netscape browser. So OpenAI could stay on the right side of your, of your list as durable if they leverage the category that they're creating, can get the scale, and if they can get the scale, just like Twitter, that failed so many times that they still hung around. So it was a product that was always <laughs> successful, right? So, I mean, it, it should have- yes, You're right, it was terrible, yeah. we kept coming back. The, <laughs> fail, the fail whale, but it still grew. So yeah. OpenAI has that moment, they could do it. If Microsoft doesn't meddle too much with, with too much power as a vendor, they could be the Netscape navigator without the anti-competitive behavior of somebody else. So to me, they have the, the pole position, so they have an opportunity. So if, if not, if they don't execute, then there's opportunity, there's not a lot of barriers to entry vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the CapEx of, say, a cloud company like AWS. Yeah. You can't replicate that, many have tried, but I think you can replicate um, open AI. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, so, but real quick, I want to bring in some ETR data. Uh, this isn't an ETR heavy segment, only because it's so new, you know, they don't cover it yet, but they do cover AI. So basically what we're seeing here is a, is a slide on the vertical axis is net score, which is a measure of spending momentum, and then the horizontal axis is is presence in the data set. Think of it as a market presence. 
And in the insert right there, you can see how the dots are plotted, the, 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 the two columns. Um, and so, but the key point here that we want to make, there's a bunch of companies on the left, you see like you know, Data Robot and C3 AI and some others, but the, the big whales, Google, AWS, Microsoft, are really dominant in, in this market. So that's really the key, key takeaway that you, we- Notice uh, IBM is way low. Yeah, IBM's low, and actually bring that back up. Uh, and you see, but, but, but then you see Oracle, who actually is injecting, I guess that's the other point is, you're not necessarily going to go buy AI and you know, build your own AI, you're going to, it's going to be there and it's, it, it, Salesforce is going to embed it into its platform, the SaaS companies, and, and you're going you're gonna to purchase AI, you're not necessarily going to build it, but some companies obviously I will. mean the quote IBM's um, general manager, uh, Rob Thomas, you can't have AI with IA, information architecture, and David, uh, you can't have AI without IA. Without, you can't have yeah. AI without IA. You can't have it. If you have an information architecture, you then can power AI. Yeah. Yesterday, David Flynn with Hammersmith was on our SuperCloud. He was pointing out that the relationship of storage, where you store things, also impacts the data addressability. And Jamak from Next Data, she was yeah. pointing out that same thing. So the data problem factors into all this too, Dave. So you got the big cloud and internet giants. They're all poised to go after this opportunity. Microsoft is investing up to 10 billion. Google's Code Red, which was you know uh, the headline in the New York Times. Of course, Apple is is there, and several alternatives in the market today. Guys like Chinchilla, Bloom. There's a company Jasper, and several others. And then Lena Khan looms large, and the governments around the world, EU, US, China, all taking notice before the market really has coalesced around a single player. You know, John, you mentioned Netscape. Mm -hmm. They kind of really, the US government was way late to that game. It was kind of game over. And Netscape, I remember Barksdale was like, nah, we're going to be selling software in the enterprise anyway. And then psh, the company just yeah. dissipated. So, but it looks like the US government, especially with Lena Khan, they're changing the definition of antitrust and what, what, what the cause is to go after people. And they're really much more aggressive. It's only what two years ago that. Yeah, the that, problem that I have with the the, the problem I have with the federal oversight is this: they're always like late to the game and they're slow to catch up. So in other words, they're working on stuff that should have been solved a year and a half, two years ago, around some of the social networks, hiding behind some of the the, the rules around uh, uh, open web back in the days. And I think but they're like 15 years late to that to that. They're, and, and now they got this new thing on top of it. So like. I just worry about them getting their fingers. But there's only two years, you know, open I, AI. No, but the thing is no, 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 they're no. still fighting other battles, but the, the problem with government is that they're going to label big tech as like a evil thing, like pharma, it's, it's like, you know, it's yeah, like smoking. Khan wants to yeah. kill big tech. So, so, no so I think big tech is getting a very seriously bad rap. And I think anything that the government does that shades darkness on tech is politically motivated. In most cases, you can almost look at everything, and my 80-20 rule is in play here, 80% of the government activity around tech is bullshit, it's politically motivated, and the 20% is probably relevant, but off the mark and not organized. Well, market and forces have always been the determining factor of success. The governments you know, have been pretty much failed. I mean, you look at IBM's antitrust, that, what did that do? The market ultimately beat them. You look at Microsoft in the, back in the day, Right, Windows 95 was peaking, the government came in, but you know, like you said, they missed the web, yeah. right? And so There's they, they were hanging on to, to Windows. And so, so you're, I think you're right, it's market forces that are going to determine this, but Sarjeet, what do you make of Microsoft's big bet here? You weren't impressed with, with Nadella. How do you think, when are they going to apply it? Is this going to be a Hail Mary for Bing or is it going to be applied elsewhere? What do you think? They are saying that they will sort of weave this into their products, office product productivity, and, and also to write code as well, uh, developer productivity as well, that's a big play for them. But coming back to your antitrust sort of uh, comments, right? I, 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 I believe the, the you, your comment was like, oh, Fed was late 10 years or 15 years earlier, but now they're two years. But things are moving very fast now as compared to they used to move. So two years is like 10 yeah, years. Yeah, two years are like 10 years. That's the one I'm going to make that point. But <laughs> this thing is like is going like wildfire. Any new tech which comes in, that I think they're going uh, going against a distributed cha distribution channels. Lena Khan has uh, commented time and again that the marketplace model is that she she wants to have some grip on cloud marketplaces are a kind of monopolistic kind of way I don't, of- I don't see this, I don't see a chat AI. You told me it's not yeah. Bing. 
you, you had you had an interesting comment. No, no, first Microsoft. of all, this is great from Microsoft. If you're Microsoft, Why? because Microsoft doesn't have the AI chops that Google has, right? Google has got so much core competency on how they run their search, how they run their back ends, their cloud, even though they don't get a lot of cloud market share. In the enterprise, they got a kick-ass cloud because they needed one. Totally. Um, they've invented SRE. I mean, Google's development and engineering chops are off the scales, right? Amazon's got some good chops, but Google's got like 10 times more chops than, than AWS, in my opinion. Cloud's a whole different story. Microsoft gets AI, they get a playbook, they get a product that can render into the, not only Bing, productivity software, helping people write papers, okay. PowerPoint. Also, don't forget the cloud. AI can super help. We had this conversation on our, our super cloud event where AI is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting around understanding observability and managing service meshes to managing microservices to turning on and off applications and or maybe writing code in real time. So there's a plethora of use cases for Microsoft to deploy this. Combined with their R&D budgets, they can then turbocharge more research, build on it. So I think this gives them a car in the game. Uh, Google may have pole position with, in, with AI, but this puts Microsoft right in the game. And they already have a lot of stuff going on, but this just, just I mean, everything gets lifted up. Security, cloud, productivity suite, everything. What's, what's under the hood at Google? And why aren't they talking about it? I mean, they got to be freaked out about this, no? Or, or do they have kind of a magic bullet? I, I think they have the they have the chops, definitely. Magic bullet, I don't know where they are as compared to the chat GPT-3 or four models. Like they, but if you, if you look at the online sort of, sort of um, activity and the videos put out there from Google folks, Google techno technology folks, that's the account you should look at if you are looking there. Um, they have put all these distinctions what chat GPT-3 has used, they have been talking about for a while as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a secret thing that you cannot replicate. As you said earlier, like in the beginning of, of this segment, that anybody who has more data and the capacity to process that data, which Google has both, yeah. I think they will win this. Obviously, wow. living in Palo Alto, where the Google founders are, and Google's headquarters we next so town over, <laughs> we we have we have inside information on some of the thinking, and that hasn't been reported by any outlet yet. And that is, is that from what I'm hearing from my sources, is Google has it. They don't want to release it for many reasons. One is, it might screw up their search monopoly. One, two, they're worried about the accuracy because Google will get sued because a lot of people are jumping on this this chat GPT as, oh, it does everything for me when it's clearly not 100% accurate all so the time. So Lena Khan is looming and so Yeah, Google's so like, Google's just like, this is the third, could be a third but rail. But the first thing you said is a concern. Well, no, the what, disruptive what they what they will do is do a Waymo kind chat. of thing. Will they spin out a separate company? If They're if doing the Discussions that. happening, they're going to spin out the separate company and put it over there and saying, this is AI, got search over there, don't touch that search because that's where all the revenue is. <laughs> so, okay, so that's how they deal with the, the Clay Christensen yeah. dilemma. What's the business model? Here, I mean, it's not advertising, right? Is it to charge you for a query? What, what's, how do you make money at this? It's a good question. I mean, my, my thinking is, first of all, it's cool to type stuff in and see a, a paper get written or write a blog post or give me a marketing slogan uh, for this or that or it can code. I think the API side of the business will be critical. And I think how we, Shu, uh, I know you're going to reference some of his uh, comments yesterday on SuperCloud. I think this brings a whole nother user interface into, th into technology uh, consumption. I think um, the business model, not yet clear, but it will probably be some sort of either API and developer environment, or just a straight up free consumer product with some sort of freemium backend thing for business. And he so, was saying too, uh, it's natural language is yeah. the way in which you're yeah. going to interact with these systems. I think it's APIs, it's APIs, 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 because the, these people who are cooking up these models and it takes a lot of compute power to train these and to uh, for inference as well. Uh, somebody did the analysis on the, on the how, how, much, how many cents a Google search uh, costs to Google and how many cents it, um, the chat GPT query costs. It's, you know, 100x or something like that. You can take a look at that. 100x on which You're side? saying two orders yeah. of magnitude more expensive for chat GPT. Much more, yeah. Than for Google. It's very expensive. So Google's got the data, they got the infrastructure, and they got, you're saying they got the No, no, actually it's a simple query as well, but they, they are trying to put together the answers and they're going through a lot more data versus index data already, you know. Now, let me clarify. You're saying that Google's 
uh, version of ChatGPT is more efficient. No, I'm, I'm saying Google search results uh, as search what, we, what we are used to today. They're but that cheaper, would, that, that, but that can, does that gonna, is that going to confer advantages to Google's uh, 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 large language? It, it will because they're, they're deep science. You Google, know, I don't think Google search is doing a large language yeah, model on their doing. search. It's keyword search. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's the weather in Santa Cruz? Or how, what's the weather going to be? Or, you know, how do I find this? Now, they have done a smart job of doing some things with those queries, autocomplete, redirect navigation, but it's it's not entity, it's not like, hey, what's Dave Vellante thinking this week in breaking analysis? Mm -hmm. ChatGPT might get that because it'll get your breaking analysis, it'll synthesize it, there'll be some maybe some clips, it'll be like, you know, I mean. You well, I gotta tell you, it, I, I asked ChatGPT, I said I'm gonna enter a transcript of a discussion I had with Nir Zook, the, the CTO of Palo Alto Networks, and I want you to write a 750 word blog. I never input the transcript. It wrote a 750 word blog. It attributed quotes to him and it just pulled a bunch of stuff that, and said, yeah. okay, here it is. It talked about super cloud. It defined super cloud. It's made, I mean, it made you. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was a big lie. It was fraudulent, but still yeah, blew yeah. me away. Again, vanilla content yeah. and non-accurate yeah. content. So we are going to see a, a surge of misinformation on steroids, but I call it vanilla content. Wow, that's just so boring. That's yeah, so there, there's so many dangers. But, make, make, but, your, make your point. Okay. We got to, okay. So the the, the consumption. Like, how do you consume this thing? As humans, we are consuming it, and we are like getting like a nicely, like surprisingly sharp. You know, wow, that's cool. It's good to increase productivity and all that stuff, right? And on the danger, danger side as well, the bad actors can take hold of it and create fake content, and and we have the fake sort of intelligence, if you will, out there. So that's one thing. The second thing is. We are, as, as humans are consuming this as language. Like we read that, we listen to it, whatever format we consume that is. But the ultimate usage of that will be when the machines can take that output from ch likes of chat GPT and do actions based on that. The robots can work. The robot can paint your house, we were talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Right now we can't do that. Data so apps. the data has to be ingested by the machines it has to be digestible by the machines, and the machines cannot digest unorganized data right now. We will get better on the ingestion side as well. So we are getting better. Data, reason, uh, reasoning, insights, and action. I like uh, that yes. model, yeah. paint my house. So, okay. yeah, by, the getting, way, that, by the way, that'll be drones that are coming yeah, in. Spray no, painting hey, your house. It wasn't too long ago that robots couldn't <laughs> climb stairs, as I, I like to point out. Okay, and of course, it's no surprise the venture capitalists are lining up to eat at the trough, as I like to say. Let's hear, you referenced this earlier, John, let's hear what AI expert Howie Zhu said at the SuperCloud event about what it takes to clone ChatGPT. Please, play the clip. One of the VCs actually asked me the other day, right, hey, how much money do I need to spend, uh, invest to get a, you know, another shop to the open AI sort of the uh, <laughs> level? <laughs> you know, I did a sound. I know. $100 million is the order magnitude I came up with, right? You know, not a billion, not 10 million, right? So 100 million. Guys, $100 million, that's an astoundingly low figure. What, what do you yeah, make of that? I, I, I was in an interview with him, I was interviewing him. I think he said 100 million or so, but in the hundreds of millions, not a billion. Right? You were trying to get him up. You were like hundreds of millions. He's like, well, no, I think I, not I, 10, yeah, not no. a billion. Well, first of all, Howie Shu is an expert in machine learning. He's at Zscaler, he's a machine learning AI guy, but he comes from VMware. He's got his technology pedigrees uh, really off the chart. Great friend of the cube. Uh, and, and kind of like a cube analyst for us, and he's smart. He's right. I think the barriers to entry from a dollar standpoint are lower than say the CapEx required to compete with AWS. Clearly, the CapEx spending to build all the tech for the run of cloud. And you don't need a huge sales. And, and in some case apps too, it's the same thing, but I think it's not that hard. But am I right about that? You don't need a huge sales force either. If, this is, what, if, the know, product's, if the product's good, it will sell. This is the new era. The better mousetrap will win. This is the new economics in software, right? Because you so. look at the amount of money, Lacework, Sneak, Snowflake, Databricks, look at the amount of money they've raised. I mean, it's like a billion dollars before they get to IPO or more because they need promotion, they need go to market. You don't Open need. Open AI's been working on this for multiple five years plus. Um, it's not, hasn't, it wasn't born yesterday. It took a lot of years to get going. And Sam is depositioning all the success because he's trying to manage expectations to your point start you earlier. It's like, yeah, he's trying to, whoa, whoa, settle down everybody. It's not that great. Because he doesn't want to yeah. fall into that, you know, hero and then get taken down. So it, it may take 100 million or 150 or 200 million to train the model, mm -hmm. but to, for the inference to, you know, to, for the inference machine, it will take a lot more. I believe. Yeah, but um, so imagine, so imagine. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. No, but because it, it consumes a lot more compute cycles and it needs a certain level of storage and everything, right, which they already have. So I think to compute uh, is different, uh, to train the model is a different cost, but to run the business is a different, because I think uh, 100 million can go into just finding the Fed. Well, there's a flywheel too. Yeah. Well, that's the yeah. like so, if you're running so the business, it's, right? a, it's an interesting number, but it's also kind of like context to it. So here, 100 million spend it, you get there, but you got to factor in the fact that the way companies win these days is critical mass, scale, uh, fly, hitting a flywheel. If they can keep that flywheel of the value that they got going on and get better, you can almost imagine a marketplace where, hey, we have proprietary data. We are we're a silicon angle in the cube. We have proprietary content, cube videos, transcripts. Well, wouldn't it be great if someone in the marketplace could sell a module for us? Right, we buy that, Amazon's thing and things like that. So if they can get a marketplace going where you can apply to data sets that may be proprietary, you can start to see this become bigger. And so I think the key barriers to entry is going to be success. I'll give you an example, Re uh, Reddit. Reddit is successful and it's hard to copy, not because of the software. They built the moat. Because you can, you can buy Reddit open source they, software they and try to compete. They built their community. Yeah. Their community, their scale, their user expectation. Twitter we referenced earlier, that thing should have gone under in the first two years, yeah. but there was such a great emotional product. Yeah. People would tolerate the fail whale and then yeah, when I was a whole nother thing. Then so a plane like, landed on yeah. the Hudson <laughs> and it was over. Yeah. I, I think verticals, a lot of verticals will build applications using using these models, like for lawyers, for doctors, for scientists, for content creators. For so you have many hundreds of millions of dollars investments that are going to be seeping out. Yeah. If, all right, we, we got to wrap. If you had to put odds on it that, that OpenAI is going to be the leader, maybe not a winner take all leader, but like you look at like Amazon and cloud, they're not winner take all, these aren't necessarily winner take all markets. It's not necessarily a zero sum game, but let's call it winner take most. What are you? What, are, what odds would you give that OpenAI, ten years from now, will be in that position? Yeah, from zero to ten kind of thing. Yeah, oh, it's like a horse race. Oh. You know, three to one, two to one, even money, ten to one, fifty to one. Uh, to maybe two to one. Two to one. That's a pretty low odds. Yeah. That's basically saying they're they're the favorite. They're the front yeah. runner. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I'd say four to one. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm like a five to one, seven to one type of person because I'm a skeptic with, you yeah. know, there's so much competition, but. Um, I think well, they're, the, they're definitely the leader. I mean, you got to Oh, say, there's no question. I mean. Right, there's no question about it. The question it. is, can they execute? They're not Friendster, is what you're they're saying. Not Friendster, they're not Friendster, and they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're more like Twitter and Reddit where they have momentum if they can execute on the product side, and if they don't stumble on that, they will continue to have the lead. If they say Password. stay neutral, if they say stay neutral, as Sam is, has been saying, that hey, Microsoft is one of our partners. If you look at their company model, how they have structured the company, then they're going to pay back to the investors. Like Microsoft is the biggest one, uh, up to uh, certain like by certain number of years, they're going to pay back from all the money they make, and after that, they're going to give the money back to the to the public to the. I don't know who they give it to, like non-profit or something. Okay, the odds are, it's, it's, odds are dropping. It's very <laughs> that's that's it, it, oh, that's no, a good point. Actually, though. that might have might they might have done that to to fend off the the criticism of this, but but it's uh, very interesting to see what the model they have adopted. The wild card in all this. My last word on this is that if there's a developer shift in how developers and data can come together. Again, we have conversations around the future of data, yeah. super cloud and meshes versus, you know, how data, the data world coding with data, mm -hmm. how that evolves will also dictate because a wild card could be a shift in the landscape around how developers are using either machine learning or AI like techniques to, to, to code into their apps. So That's fantastic insights. I can't thank you enough for your, for your you. time. <laughs> On the heels of super cloud too, really appreciate it. All right. Thanks to John and Sar Sarbjeet for the outstanding conversation today. Special thanks to the Palo Alto studio team. My goodness, Anderson, this great backdrop. You guys got it all out here, I'm, I'm jealous. And uh, Noah, really appreciate it. Chuck, Andrew Frick, uh, and, and Cameron. Andrew Frick switching, Cameron on the video lake, great job. And Alex Meyerson, he's on production, manages the podcast for us. Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and our newsletters. Rob Hof is our editor in chief over at Silicon Angle. He does some great editing. Thanks to all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. All you got to do is search Breaking Analysis Podcast wherever you listen. Publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. 
want to get in touch, email me directly, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn post. And by all means, check out etr.ai. They got really great survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante from Cube Insights, powered by etr. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.